Today's date is for June 2022. My name is Dennis Gill with the Americans in Wartime Experience. I'm here in Reading, Pennsylvania. I've got the pleasure of talking to Harold Ziegler. So thank you, sir, for sitting down and talking to us. Well, good morning, and thank morning. you very much. Good morning. Uh, if you could just give us a little bit of background about yourself. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, my parents moved to Florida, and I grew up down there, joined the Navy down there out of high school. I was that young when I went in. Uh, they had to sign for me, 17. They had to draft back then in the 60s, you know. Okay. And school was over in June. I was still 17. My birthday was in August. So uh, I came home one day and they had the recruiters would go by at, at school. and. The uh, talk to all of them, you know, legal way of skipping class, you know. But anyway, the thing was, I uh, came home one day and told my dad, I said, There's a man going to come over to me, uh, to, to come over to the house this evening after supper. He wants to talk to you about me. And he says, He's with the police. I said, No. He said, Well, then I'll talk to him. And my dad was a Pearl, at Pearl Harbor when the Japanese hit it in 41. So, uh, we were there at the dinner table and knock came to the door and my dad says, you stay put, I'll answer the door. He gets up there and he walks up to the door and of course it's summer and here stood this chief petty officer, all in his whites, white shoes, white everything. He looked like uh, the Pillsbury Doughboy standing there, you know, and my dad looked like a deer in the headlights because he couldn't believe what he was looking at. It took him a minute or two to figure out what what he was just looking at. And then when he realized what he was looking at, oh, come on in, come on in. And it went on from there. And my father says to me, do you know what you're getting yourself into? I says, yeah. He said, you know, this is not a game. This is for real. I said, yeah. And he said, you know, you'll probably wind up in Southeast Asia. I said, well, yeah. But I says, if I got to go, I want to pick who I go with and when I go. So he says, okay. And being I was under 18, they had to sign for me. Mom turned on the water work. She didn't want me to go, but I said, well, I can go now with your blessing, or you can wait till I turn 18 and then you can watch me go because I had to sign up for the draft. Right. I was in the Navy about a year when I got a manila envelope. Mom would send correspondence and everything from home. And I dumped it out on my rack and there was this official military envelope in there, Manila. It says, Selective Service Board. Well, after reading it three or four times, because I'd never been drafted before, I wanted to take it pretty serious, you know. I thought, well, it was fun while it lasted, so I went to see my division officer and told him I had to pack my stuff and leave. He said, why, where are you going? I said, well, dude, Uncle Sam calls. I'm in the Army now, you know. He said, let me look at that. He said, get the hell out of here. And that was the beginning and the end of my Army career. Right. I gave six years to the Navy. Right. What, uh, what drew you to the Navy? I don't know. It. I always liked water, and growing up, I was around boats and everything like this. And ships have always been a turn on. So, and I like being around boats and ships. And where I went. Right. Um, you have any other uh, family members that were veterans? You mentioned your dad. My dad was in the army. Uh, during when at the time of the attack. I went Pearl Harbor. He was 60, uh, he was in the, the 60, uh, well, let's see, this is the 24th Infantry patch. He was in the 24th Infantry, all Hawaii, uh, 24th Division, 24th Division, all Hawaiian. He was in the 63rd Field Artillery. He was a cannoneer on a 105 howitzer, and they were stationed at uh, Schofield Barracks okay. up in Wahiawa at the time of the attack. Him and his buddies were heading out for breakfast that Sunday morning. They had pancakes on Sunday, you know, and, uh, well, never got the pancakes. Yeah. Two waves come through Gunsight Pass just north of Wahiawa. There's two mountains. and. When you look at the mountains from Schofield Barracks, it looks like it forms the rear of a gun site. And the GIs, GIs would call it Gunsight Pass. 
and two waves, 362 planes from six carriers come through there. And the first wave broke one way, and but their job to take out airfields and anything it come up and beat them in the air. And the second wave to the harbor, and my brother. He was drafted. He was in Vietnam. He spent two years in the army. Okay. Um, what year did you join the Navy? Sixty-four. Sixty-four. What, when, where did you go to basic? I was in Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. And what year did you get to uh, Vietnam? Sixty-five. Sixty-five. Okay. What, what did you do in the Navy? What was your? Uh, I was a bosun mate. Okay. What does uh, that mean? Well, I started off chipping paint and painting things, and they didn't know what the hell to do. You just get out there and chip and paint, you know. Right. If uh, they, we were always told, if it moves, salute it. If it don't, paint it. So okay. we, uh, that's what I did until they found out I had an affinity for ropes and knot, uh, knots and that kind of carrying on, and my painting days were done. From then on out, I went around putting Turks heads and on everything and stitching canvas over stanchion posts and wound up uh, actually working uh, on an admiral's barge on a carrier doing the fancy work hanging in the windows. Right. When you were in Vietnam, what ship were you on? I was on the Independence, okay. CVA-62. What kind of uh, ship is that? That's an aircraft carrier. Okay. Okay. C stands for carrier, V stands for fixed wing, and A stands for attack. Gotcha. They dropped the A, I guess they we don't attack anybody anymore. I don't understand that, but you know. What, what type of um, aircraft would have been on that? Oh, well, a lot of cool stuff. We had the Intruders. We had Skyhawks. We had the F-4 Phantoms. We had the RA-5C Vigilantes. We had helicopters, uh, the little we call them the CODs, which were the two-engine planes. They were the, like the male planes and ones that take people to and from the carrier. Uh, we had the advanced radar aircraft that would fly out and advance what they call the eyes of the ship. The uh, radars on the ship could go out about 150 miles. The, with this thing in the air, could throw another two or 300 miles out there on it and give you a pretty good head up, heads up of what's coming at you. Right. Tell us about your experiences actually in combat, when you're actually in, in uh, on the yeah. On the carrier? Yeah. I was a qualified helmsman, and it was really weird because here I am, 19 years old, and at the helm of an aircraft carrier, 1,086 feet long, about 186,000 tons, 5,000 men, and I'm plowing through the South China Seas, and I'm like, whoa, this is pretty cool, you know what right. I mean? One guy with all that in his hands, uh, not everybody gets a wheel that kind of firepower, you know? Right. So then there were different procedures for uh, steaming alongside and underweight underway replenishments, entering and leaving ports, and flight operations, launching and recovering aircraft. The qualified helmsman would be on there, and the uh, it was really neat when you're getting ready for a flight operation, a Marine would step onto the bridge, and we had Marine detachments on the carriers. And Marine would step onto the bridge and say, the captain's on the bridge. Uh, the officer of the deck would say, captain's on the bridge, aye, sir. Everything was repeated. Okay. Then uh, there were two seats, a port and starboard seat on the bridge for the captain to sit in. He would sit in the starboard seat, that's the one on the right, for underway replenishment so he could look down on the ships and see what's going on. The one on the left was out over the flight deck. This way he could sit and watch the flight deck and the launching and recovering aircraft. He would sit down in his seat and look for a minute or two. Then he would turn to the uh, officer of the deck as it turned my ship into the wind. Okay. 
that's when the fun started. <laughs> the officer of the deck would turn to me, the helmsman, and say, helmsman, bring your rudders right or left 15 degrees, and you'd spin that wheel, and up on the console there was a needle that would just move freely like that. It was electrohydraulic steering from the uh, helm down to the after steering and hydraulic from down there to the rudders. And you just stop it when that uh, needle hit 15 and you would say, my rudders are right 15 degrees. And the officer of the deck would say, very well. At, I would count like this, you could count one, two, three, and this carrier is still moving straight like this, and all of a sudden those rudders would answer up and she'd lean like that right. to port as you're making your starboard turn or the other way around. Uh, they generally would turn to starboard this way, the island would go towards the center and did this for balance. Uh, the ship, the officer of the deck would then turn to the guy on the EOT, engine order telegraph. Now this is the days before nuclear carriers and they were still oil fired and he would say, uh, Lee Helmsman, all ahead full and he would drop these things down to where it said full and it would answer up down in the engine room. Bells would down there would raise the dead, you know. Mm -hmm. They would look up to see what the bridge was calling for. They would open up the steam valves, the black smoke would come out and she'd start <clears throat> really starting to crank. Then he would pick up the phone to uh, this signal plot, the signal bridge, the next level up, and they would uh, say, let the ships in company know we're turning the ship into the wind, we're gonna commence launching aircraft. Right. Of course, at night you, you couldn't see our signals, but you could look out there and see the flashing lights where they were answering us, and during the day, the, the flag hoist just come up out of the bags, and that sort of thing. It was, uh, Impressive. When you're 19 years old and you're part of this, you go, whoa. Right. So then when you study up on, you, every time the ship would pass 10 degrees, you would say passing whatever, zero, nine, zero, and it say very well. And you study up on your new course. But then once you were studying on your new course, they study on new course, so and so, and he would say very well. And at that point, the officer of the deck would turn to the captain and say, the ship's in the wind. And he would, captain would pick up the phone back to the uh, air ops, which is at the back of the island. And he would say the ship's in the wind and commence launching aircraft. <clears throat> then this really thing really came to life. Now they say one of the most dangerous places in the world that works on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. When all your handlers and men down there range somewhere between the ages of 18 and 25, the, that's the lion's share of them. Right. <clears throat> and you have all these jet aircraft moving around and they're all this sort of thing. And <clears throat> and Yankee Station in Vietnam, all aircraft were rigged for what they call a class alpha strike. That's everything that the thing aircraft can carry and still fly. <clears throat> Bombs, rockets, guns, bullets, the whole nine yards. And they would bring them up onto the catapults and You'd see him go up there on the catapults with the hand signals, and once he got up on the catapult, the uh, plane would stop. They would uh, jet black deflectors would come up out of the deck because without those up there, when they turn these things up, it would blow people all over the place. So this way, when the jet exhaust hit it, it would just shoot it up in the air. Then what he would do is go like this to the pilot, and the hydraulic nose wheel would come up forcing the nose into the air, which would allow more air under the aircraft when it left the deck. Then he would go like this to the pilot, and then you would see the wings and the tail, the ailerons and right. all that stuff moving. He would give him a thumbs up. Now all the, all, all the pilots were officers so in these aircraft. So then what he would do like on a Phantom, which had two J-79s in it, he would go like this, one, and he'd go like this and turn it up until you see the fire, the afterburner kick in. And on the J-79, it was 15,000 pounds of thrust. The afterburner kicked in, you got another 3,000, which gave you 18,000. And when they were both going, that was 86,000 pounds of thrust. And if it was airborne, you had to take that sucker straight up into the air and do, do a victory rules if that's what the pilot wanted to do. You know, yeah. Pretty wild stuff. And then 
when he would go like that, the one the fire come out the back, he would give the pilot the thumbs up. Then he would go like this, and then he keep going until the, the afterburners kick in on the second one, and he'd go like that. And because they were officers, they salute him. They go like this, and he goes. And when he goes like that, the pilot would reach up there, and they had a handhold inside that cockpit because right. he's fixing to go for a ride, whether he wanted to or not. Yeah. You go from a hundred and zero to 150 knots in a heartbeat you know what i mean yeah. and he goes like this like that and he goes the pilot would reach up he goes like salutes him and when he d goes down he'd d go down and touch the deck when that finger touched the deck there would be a shooter over in the catapults to go boom, and <clears throat> that plane just squat down and she's gone yeah. uh today the shooters are in a little bubble out the flight deck and things have changed yeah. but that was a long time ago right Right. What, how, how many um, how many people are on that carrier, the Independence? Uh, crew. Crew was about 24, 2500. Okay. That ship's company. Uh, when you got the air wing on there, had about another 24, 2500. Right. So roughly about 5,000. Right. When you had the air wing on there. Right. That's Navy and Marine Corps. No, the air wing are the pilots, which are stationed in air bases all around the country. Okay. And what they would do is they would fly in from uh, air bases wherever the, their squadron was stationed. Right. And they, uh, all the stuff was trucked in and then all the gear was loaded off trucks and stuff onto the carrier and the guys would take it to their uh, respective uh, stations, uh, warehouses, storerooms, wherever they was, and workshops, wherever they were gonna work. Right. And it got set up. The, the aircraft didn't come on till the ship was out at sea. Right. And then they would fly those on okay. uh, once she was out at sea. Mm -hmm. But all the, the rest of the air wing was already on there and all set up. Yeah. So when the pilots landed, they were good to go. Yeah. Okay. So it was a floating city, essentially. I mean, that's a lot of people. They, they had everything. We had a library. We had uh, fantastic uh, surgical staff. Uh, two mess decks forward and aft for the crew. You had what they had called the CPO's mess, chief petty officers. They were had their own uh, galley. Mm -hmm. uh, then there was the officer's mess, and that was up in officer's country, and that was another. So there were four or five places to eat on this ship, depending on where, in, where your rank took you. And, and so your job as the helmsman was basically to steer the ship. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, when I wasn't st steering the ship, then I had other duties like uh, tying knots or doing whatever they wanted us to do. Gotcha. When you were in uh, entering or leaving ports, then we were responsible for our section of the ship, and we had to tie the ship up to the pier or untie the ship, and then you had to do what they call wrap the lines and uh, once everything were over and put the rat guards on all that kind of carrying on yeah. and then there was the painting and shipping yeah. the paint and all that weird stuff that's what both mates did right sure. so you you have a lot of probably not a lot of downtime while you're while you're deployed uh, no no you, you you're either working or sleeping pretty much yeah. pretty much uh, and then you you have time for writing letters and this kind of stuff and we were always getting into something, you know. They always had something for us to do, you know, idle hands and that sort of thing. Right. So they kept you pretty busy. Um, of course, then when we get into a port, we let our hair down, and <laughs> that's when the fun, <laughs> fun started. Right. What ports did you, did you stop in? Well, it depended on the cruise. If we were in the Pacific, you and we were in Vietnam, uh, we operated out of Subic Bay in the Philippines, and then you had... Uh, Liberty ports like Yakuska, Japan, uh, that uh, when we were in the Mediterranean, those med cruises, I think we like to hit just about every country that touched water over there. We would be in places like Cannes, France, right. and then when you were on shore, then you could jump a train and go to places like Gulf, Juan, Nice, Monaco, okay. and this sort of thing. Then when you were in Spain, we were in Barcelona. Uh, that was a fun port of call. 
uh, then we would go to the island of Mallorca, which is about a uh, hundred miles south of Barcelona in the Mediterranean, and that's Spanish. And the tennis star, was it, uh, Rafael Nadal? Yes. He comes from uh, that island. Okay. And from there, you have Italy, you had we would hit ports like Genoa, Naples, uh, Nice, and we were in Palermo, Sicily, uh, Greece. We were in uh, Athens, uh, Corinthians Bay, and Turkey. We're in Istanbul, Beirut, Lebanon, all over the place. How long? How Malta. long were you, were you stationed on that ship? I was on there two years. Two years, okay. Yeah. And specifically um, in support of operations in Vietnam for a year? Yes. Okay. Cruises were about nine months. Okay. So did, so when you left to go to Vietnam, you were out for nine months? Um, yes. Actually on, on? Yes. Okay. All right. Did you, there's any, so you didn't stop at any ports during that period of time? Oh sure, you did. We operated out of the Philippines, like I said. Okay, so how, how long? Subic Bay, uh, and Generally. then we had Liberty ports, like in uh, Yokosuka, Japan. Okay, and it, would you go in there? And because uh, the bombs in World War II, they didn't want any nuclear ships at that time in Japan. Now they're all nuclear, and they don't care. You know, yeah. you want them in there, you got to take a nuclear ship. Right, but. Uh, at that time, only non-nuclear ships were allowed in there. Uh, we, yeah, yeah. So it it, it depended on when we were out there. It was pr pretty much business, and the carriers were support for the army on the uh, on the ground. In other words, our job, and we, because we were so big, we could stay out there longer. In fact, we carried enough fuel and everything that we actually would fuel destroyers and things, our escort vessels. They would come alongside and we could take care of them okay. um, and give them supplies and stores because we, we had so much. Yeah. Um, the thing, the carriers were out there for business and when the army ran into trouble and they wanted an airstrike, they'd call in an airstrike and away the pilots went and they bombed or they bombed something. Yeah. Okay. How many sorties uh, a day would you normally fly? Did it vary? It varied. Pretty much consistent. It, it, it varied. It, it depended on what the mission was. Okay. You know, uh, some days it wouldn't be that much. Some days it would be quiet. You know, other days, you know, you just couldn't work fast enough. And on the mess decks, on a carrier, the magazines were below decks. And when we weren't in combat, the mess tables, the tables and the benches were all set up so we could sit down and eat our meals. When we were in a war zone in combat situation, the elevators from the magazines would come up to the mess decks and the tables and benches were all taken away. Okay. Now you had bomb skids sitting all over the place with uh, side winders, on, uh, a pod with si three Sidewinder missiles on it. You would have a thousand pounder or two thousand pound bomb sitting on a bomb skid. And of course, here's where they armed them and put the, got everything all squared away and got them ready to go back up to the hangar deck where they would mount them on the aircraft, then up to the flight deck and yeah. deliver them. Uh, but for the crew, the inconvenience was the mess tables were gone. So when it come time to eat, if you were on a, uh, 500 pounder uh, that was a one man bomb so you'd be straddling this thing like this and your plate sits on your tray sits on the bomb and you were on a thousand pounder that was a two man bomb now you had we were looking at each other with the plates in the center was, so you were eating on top of munitions well yeah you just <laughs> sit on a bomb and had lunch you know whatever right, right. wow um what was uh, your living conditions like? Where did you stay? Was it just a bunk that you basically slept in and then? 
When I first started off on the destroyer, my destroyer I was on was the English, DD-696. It was a World War II can commissioned in 1943, decommissioned in 70. I was on her in 64. The Being a World War II can, it had the old wire, the old metal frame uh, on the rack, and then they had the big piece of canvas lashed in with line, and then you had <coughs> Uh, uh, about a three inch uh, mattress thrown on top with the fart sack covering the mattress. Now a fart sack, all that was was uh, it's like a bed sheet but it was folded up kind of like a made kind of like a bag and what you would do is you put put the mattress on your head take it off your rack, put it on your head and now it's hanging down like this and you take your fart sack and go like this and start at one end and go up like this and then when you were done, there was some uh, little strings on the end, pieces of uh, material, and you would tie it off once it was all done, and then you'd just throw it up there. And if it looked a little rubby, grubby, what you would do, just flip it, and, and you had a clean sheet on the other side. And that's, what, that's uh, the way that was. That was on the destroyer. When we were on the carrier, we had nice uh, bunks. Uh, and the uh, lockers, well, that changed probably quite a bit, but ours, the, our, our locker was on the bottom like a big tray, and then it, the top part with the mattress on folded up. You put all your gear in there, and then when it was closed, you could lock it and then crawl in. When we never had to worry about it on the carrier, but on the destroyer, at night when you got in bed, you had three straps. You would sit in bed and strap your legs in and then you'd strap your waist in and then when you lay down you would strap your top self in wow. this way if the ship start rolling you didn't roll out of bed you were in so you made sure you went to the sandbox first and the thing of it was a lot of guys didn't want to do all the climbing to get on the top bunk they wanted the bottom bunk they wanted to be able to come in and sit down yeah and <clears throat> i never wanted the bottom bunk i always wanted the top there was a lot of advantages to having the top bunk. Right. Because, <clears throat> one, if you have a bottom bunk, whoever's going into the top bunk, he's stepping on your sheets and getting them dirty. Right. Two, uh, when you were in the top bunk, you had that storage space on these ships is very, very limited. So when you were on the top bunk, you had that whole overhead up in there with all these vents and things like You could stuff all kind of stuff up in goodies up there and hide all kind of chow, you know, you lay it up there and have a treat at night, you know, right. with the other guys. But uh, then, when you get into a storm, and you know, let's say shit blows downhill, the thing was, if a guy gets sick, this stuff goes down and don't come up. You know what I mean? So if you're on the bottom rack and the guy up on the top is sick, dude, he's raining down on you. That's not good. No. So you're up on the top, you don't have that to worry about. And it was, it was, but that was the way the sleeping arrangements were there. Yeah. Unlike on submarines where your sleeping arrangements were uh, limited and you slept in shifts. Okay. You know, when you're up doing your thing, I'm in your rack sleeping. And when I'm up doing my thing, you're in the same rack and you're sleeping. But right. nowadays on the big submarines, you know, they don't have that problem. You know, They're like underwater islands, you know. How was you uh, able to keep in touch with family? Uh, Postal Service. Okay. Paré Bon. Airmail, and what you would do is the ship had a post office, <clears throat> and you would write. And uh, when you were over there, you don't have much need for a lot of money. Uh, well, when you were in the the med, you hung on to it pretty good. But when you were in Southeast Asia, in these combat zones, you would get combat pay. So the the paychecks were kind of sweet. And since you didn't need all that, what you would do is you'd go up to the post office and get money orders and send them home. Okay. And then mom would put them in the bank for you. So when you got home, you had a nest egg and there was a car waiting on you. Yes. <laughs> <That's> nice. <laughs> uh, but that's, and of course, then the, the uh, always knew where the ship was going to be. And the mail followed it from the states, wherever the fleet post office. And it would go for that ship. So it'd be sitting there at the next port of call, right. 
and when we go in, they'd send a, a, a mail boat in, a Liberty boat, and he would pick up the mail and bring it back, and of course then the post office divvied it out to the divisions. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any Liberty posts or uh, ports that were maybe your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Without getting into too much detail. <laughs> uh, Philippines. That that was fun. That was really fun. And I had a lot of uh, had a lot of fun in, in the um, in the med. The med was nice. That was some beautiful ports of call. Yeah. Cannes, France, uh, Naples, Italy. You could smell that before you saw it. It, it okay. was it, it was strange, and. We, we would get off the ship and you go in there and because it was we're on a carrier we had to anchor out you couldn't go like a smaller ship go in and tie up it was pretty wild and then you go in there and they have these little kids with their little bocce set up on that fleet landing and they would go hey sailor shish kebab good shish kebab you know and he, he's got him down there cooking on his uh his bocce and in Naples, there were wharf, wharf rats around down there the size of house cats, you know, they were big. Right. And we used to always to joke, and he goes, shish kebab, and he said, dude, I was in here yesterday, and there was a dog running around, I don't see it where today. He went, good shish kebab, no, you eat it, I'll watch, right. you know what I mean? You didn't know what you were eating. So I, yeah. I did best with it. But that smell stuck with you. And even today, when uh, the smells of these ships, uh, you go to visit some of these museum ships sitting around up on deck you don't notice it but when you go below decks there's that smell yeah. and it puts you back 55 60 years and yeah. Putting, yeah. Just, just the way it was right. yes are there any incidents that stand out what do your time while you were uh, deployed uh, in Vietnam mm. one day after the next was the same pretty much yeah. pretty much uh, like I say, the real action stations on an aircraft carrier are the flight decks. And that was what we called the uh, Airedales. Uh, and then I was part of what they called the Black Shoes, fleet sailors. So the, most of the time, the only time we would uh, get hooked up with one another is we got into ports of call and got drunk and started fighting one another. But other than that, uh, it was we had our things to do. They had their things to do, and it was, right. we'd meet. And but as far as remembering anybody's name or anything like that, if you weren't part of the squadron and travel with them or live with them, right? You know. What, what was the year that you were in? In Vietnam or supporting combat operations? 65. 65. Yes. Okay. So, you know, the war wasn't that popular in the United States. I don't know that it ramped up yet, though, with the protests. Nah, Was there well. Was that going on while you were, while you were over there? Uh, you nah. Were there? They. Nah. There, we would see this stuff going on back home and hear about it. Uh, you would, when you come back home on leave, you would see stop signs where they put the international stop on, uh, or they would put paint on their war across the stop sign, so right. it says stop war. Right. And this kind of course, you had your flower children and the hippies, and the, the hippie movement at that time, and Woodstock. I got a bumper sticker with the Vietnam ribbon on it and a uh, silhouette of an M14 and the caption says in 1965 this is the only Woodstock I remember you know right. uh, the uh, no nah, there were those that just uh, couldn't see it and unfortunately the same group still is around and exists today in fact it's even worse than it was then. Uh, they don't run to the sound of the guns, they run from it. And they want others to do their fighting for them, which is totally and truly sad. Yeah. Because uh, it's just sad. Did you experience any of the hostilities when you came home? Oh yeah, yeah. oh sure. Oh yeah, boy did we ever. 
In fact, when I left the ship, uh, they handed out National Defense ribbons like uh, popcorn at a theater. You joined, you weren't even out of boot camp, and you got the National Defense ribbon just for joining. Right. So everybody had that, and everybody knew what the damn thing was, uh, and everybody knew what the Vietnam ribbons looked like. So when I left the ship, all that fruit salad that I picked up while I was over there, I left on the ship. All I wore was the National Defense Ribbon. And then when I, somebody said, were you in Vietnam? Who me? Does it look like it? Hell no, I wasn't over there. Well, don't go, don't go protest. Well, I'll do that. Yeah. And they go away and leave you alone. And you were out from under all the confrontation and everything. I've seen guys come, run up behind them uh, and, and just cold cock them. I mean, just cheap shots hit them in the back of the head or in the back. They called us, they'd spit on us and call us all kind of vile crap, baby killer and all this kind of carrying on. And yet they're burning their draft cards and running away to Canada. Hell, we even had a president do that. That's neither here or there. You know. We did. We did. <laughs> had good old Hanoi Jane over there messing around with the other side. Yeah. And then they get on the, the 6 o'clock news with CNN, Communist News Network, and uh, want to tell us how to believe and what to think and how to behave. Yeah. They're out there fraternizing with the enemy and say, yeah, I'm going to follow your lead, sure. Right. You know. Looking back on it, how do you think your wartime experience affected your life? It changes you forever. It changes you forever. If I could work my will, every boy, girls, totally optional. It'd be up to them. But if I could work my will, every boy, when he turned 18, he'd be automatically in the military. Now, it'd be up to him to pick which branch, and since Trump come along and made a new one, you got six choices. Right. You know, just pick one, dude. You're in. You've got two years of mandatory service. Enjoy. And there's a reason for that. Not that I'm militaristic and I just see one of everybody go out there and learn how to shoot a gun and kill somebody. That's not the whole point. What it does is it takes a man, it takes a boy, and they make a man out of him. And I tell people, uh, parents that they're thinking about having a boy going in the military. I says today, I says, before he leaves, before he leaves, videotape him, talk to him, watch him, and see how he responds and how he answers your questions and everything. Then send him away. And when you get him back, you tape it again. And then watch the two tapes. That's as different as day and night. You sent away a boy and you got back a man. Because when they come back, it's yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Yeah. Where before it was just mom and pop. You know, and that kind of carrying on. Yeah. It, it's totally different. And once you're changed, you're changed for life. Uh, that's if there was anything in there worth changing. Yeah. If not, you know, you know, yeah. God can come down, wave, wave his arm, and it, it wouldn't make any difference. Trash is still trash, you know. Yeah. What advice would you like to give somebody who's who might watch this, you know, a hundred years down the road? Someone might see this in interview a hundred years. A hundred years? Yeah. What, what advice would you give them? Here we sit in 2022. Advice? We only pass this way once. We only pass this way once. In the grand scheme of things, we're only here for a short time. Uh, the human life is average lifespan of a man's, what, 77, 78 years. I throw another 10 on for a woman. Uh, that's nothing. In the grand scheme of things, we're a twinkle of an eye, we're here, we're going boom. What we are, what we are personally, is a gift from God. What we become is a gift to Him. Now, He's given you the most precious thing that you'll ever own. Your life. That, from the cradle to the grave, the most precious thing you'll ever own is your life. Now, what are you going to give back? Something skanky? Something gnarly? Something yeah. Trashy? I mean, when a guy gives you a gift like that, I mean, you want to return something that's halfway decent. So what you become is a gift to him. And what you become 
is totally your choice. It's totally in your hands. Uh, nobody could do it for you. And they're all your decisions. Right, wrong, makes no difference. Whatever you decide, you grew it, you chew it, you're going to have to live with it. If they're good ones, you go, yes. If they're bad, you say, well, shit happens, you know. Yeah. And hopefully they're not too bad, you can recover from it and learn from it and go on and do something else. Right. But, yeah, I would want, uh, first of all, believe in, in the Almighty, your Creator. Secondly, your country. Because it makes no difference what color your skin is, whether you're male or female, or what your ancient lineage is, or where you came from back up the road. If you were born here, you're first, last, and always an American. Yeah. Period. Or whether you're black, white, Martian green, or titty pink, you are an American. And that's all you should ever think of yourself. Not Afro-American or Asian-American. Well, that's a lot of rubbish. And all that does is divide and separate and cause friction and you know yeah. if everybody stood up and said I'm American four square if you don't like it dude let's just go outside and lock ass you know boom it would all stop and all this crazy racist BS would all just yeah. shrivel up and blow away because nobody believed in that rubbish anyway yeah. and that's all it is yep. um, before we before we end the interview I want to talk to you about uh, what it is that you're doing you're here at the World War II weekend, you're a reenactor. Yes, sir. Um, why do you do that? Well, I am a collector. But I hang out with reenactors. I'm not really a reenactor. You won't see me crawling around on the gun and firing blanks and all that kind of carrying on okay. because these are virtually museum pieces. And uh, they're kept in either ultra pristine or unissued. I've got a lot of gear that's unissued, which meant the Uncle Sam made it way back up the road. It said in warehouses, was never used, but it's old, but it's still brand new. It's released and you get it for your collections and this kind of stuff. Or other guys have collections and they're getting old and they want to get rid of some stuff, but they don't want to just throw it out. So I get it that way. A lot of it can be very salty, expensive. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, every now and then you look up and you get something. But as the collection grows over the years, I don't look at myself as a collector anymore. Because of the collection and the quality of it, I look at more at myself like a caretaker of history. I got the books and everything to go with it. I've got uh, two volume sets. Oh, I mean, two sets of one's a six volume set, one's in a four volume set of all World War One books. Uh, about World War One, the thing of it is this: they're all over a hundred years old. Right. They were being written while the war was still being prosecuted. Right. And the unique part about those, everything is in the present tense. We did this, we did that. I was here. This is what I saw, and all this, and all the pictures that, that you see in the books. The guys were all alive when these books were published. So, what you have is kind of unique. You have current information, but your current information is over a hundred years old. You go, yes. Yeah. Where else can you find this kind of stuff? Yeah. And uh, from time to time, I loan stuff out to teachers or students, and they, they go and get go into this stuff. And since the stuff don't exist anyplace else, they go nuts over this stuff, and, and the class eats it up. And I go into schools and things, and we talk about the military and that sort of thing. As far as what we're doing here this weekend, our unit, I'm with the 28th Division and we're portraying uh, the Pacific, which is kind of smart because it's summer here at an airport, there's no trees or shade. Right. It gets very, very hot. Sometimes it gets really hot. In years past, the asphalt was actually tacky. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, p the only action w here was the uh, ambulance crews taking people to the hospitals for heat exhaustion or overexposure. Yeah. What we've done is we portray the Pacific, so we all get to wear khakis and this kind of stuff, and it's all light, yes. Yeah. And all that heavy, woolly stuff is all gone, you know. Yeah. Um, but as far as the weapons and everything go, they have the mock battles and that kind of stuff, but I just 
hang out. What's the weapon you're holding now? This one is an M1 carbine. This is a Rockola. At the beginning of the war, there were 10 manufacturers of these things. Uh, it, after the summer of 43, eight of the contracts were canceled and there were only two left manufacturing. There was Inland, General Motors, and Winchester, which worked 24-7 to the end of the war, right. cranking these bears out. What you're looking here is a Rockola made by the Jukebox Company, and this came out in the summer of 43 before the contract was canceled. This was the tail end of the line. This has all the changes. When new weapons come out, they come out and they say, oh, wow, this is what we want. But they're great if you're out on a rifle range or in a test facility and everything works nice. But when you're in a combat situation, things change. You know, right. what worked great in a rifle range may suck in combat. And on the early one, they didn't have the bayonet lug. There were two uh, rivets here instead of four. And what happened is this thing here would come forward and this would piece of wood would chip and there's just a sliver of metal under here and that's all that holds this weapon together is this right. little thing here and when this thing broke off this thing would come apart and now you, your weapon was right. a mess so what they did is after the summer of 43 they went back and added another set of rivets which took care of that this little uh, ridge in here is for where the peep sight goes. And when you look in the peep sight down to your sight, you're actually looking down through this trench. On the bolt here, this is round. Before the summer 43, if you notice the, the slide indentation right here, the bolt came down and ran right along the top of this. And it was flat, which left a sharp crisp edge here and a sharp crisp edge here. And when you fire your weapon and this thing comes back, if there were dirt on there, it would go down and dump it into the weapon and when it come back, that nice, sharp, crisp edge would catch it, and now you have a jam. Gotcha. Mm. So what they did is they went to a round bolt. So if dirt gets in there now, what it does, it just spins in the dirt, and the jams are decreased. Then underneath, on the original, you had two buttons. One was a push button for the, the clip. The other was a push button for the safety. But in combat, what you would do, am I holding you up? And, and, but in combat, what you would do is you would get to run, and if you hit the wrong damn button, you would figure you're turning off your safety, but Probably really you hit this, and you just lost your bullets. Yeah. So what they did is when they reworked it, they put a flip safety on here like this, and got rid of the push button. Then back here, up on top, the on the originals, you had a flip sight, a peep sight. Okay. It was 150 yards and 300 yards, and it just would flip with its finger. After the summer of 43, they got rid of that and put the one in here for windage and elevation. Uh, this was a GI thing where he would put a thing on here and he would carry an, two 15 round packs of uh, ammo. Okay. The oiler that they talk about is this little thing in here. And that's what holds your sling onto your stock. Okay. All right. You also brought another weapon with you, Japanese. Ah, uh, boy. Now this one, this one is really interesting because this is a real piece of history. This is a real piece of history here. This weapon is a Japanese Type 99. This was taken in actual combat okay. on the island of Okinawa. It still has the chrysanthemum on it here and in Japanese it says Type 99. 99. There was a sleeve went on here, a dust cover, but the Japanese soldiers would take it off okay. and pitch it because when you were doing this, it made noise and they didn't want that noise, that rattle. Right. If you see them on the weapons today, that's GIs just trying to put stuff back together. They yeah. find parts, well, I'll put it on. Yeah. But the Japs didn't do that. Then, uh, when you look at this, this, if you notice the scuff mark here on this weapon, the scuff mark on this weapon. That was made by a round coming from, that was made by, from a US weapon. Okay. And using the guy holding the weapon as a backstop. Gotcha. When it fell on the ground, if you look on the forestock here, it, you see the burn marks. 
and that was done by a flamethrower. Okay. The guy that got it was a U.S. Marine who brought it down to a corpsman on the beach and told the corpsman to hang on to this, I'll be back. Well, the Marine never made it back for whatever reason. Uh, the corpsman took it aboard ship, uh, waiting for the Marine who never showed up, and of course the corpsman took it home. Right. And when he passed away, it went to his son, and that's how I found about it. The son and I marched in parades together, and he told me about it. He was a numismatist, a coin collector. He needed money for, to get more coins, and I collected the weapons, so we were both happy. Yeah. And of course, the story to go with it. The bayonet on here, the bayonet on here is the actual bayonet, and this gun hasn't been fired since it left Okinawa. The bayonet on here, it's got the actual blade and sharpening done by a Japanese soldier. If you look on the blade there, you see the three circles. Okay. That is from the Tokyo Arsenal. Now the Tokyo Arsenal was moved from Tokyo in the 30s to Kogura, Japan, because the Arsenal was a military target and they didn't want us bombing military targets in Tokyo. They figured if they blew up Kogura, no big deal, you know? So the edge on here is incredibly sharp and the steel is pretty good stuff since they had a lot of practice making katana swords. Right. And it still has the fog and everything, which has been treated and it'll probably last, who knows, for another hundred years. Wow. wow. Very cool. Yes. How long have you had that? This has been in my collection now, oh, maybe about 10 years. Well, it's probably one of a kind, I would think, given the patina that's on it. And well, the story that goes with it. <laughs> well, that, that that's exactly right. And, and uh, what I got probably get an incredible price for it if I sold it. But how do you replace something that you can't replace? Right, exactly. I mean, there won't be any more violence of battles on Okinawa. No. I mean, and this is the real McCoy. Uh, right. So it's one of these finds, rare finds that when you get, and of course. Since I have no issue, nobody to leave it to, my entire collection is going to go to a military museum. Everything. Yeah, very cool. Books, the whole nine yards. Yeah, very cool. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us um, again. And uh, if you don't have anything else for us, I appreciate you sitting down and telling your story. Mm -hmm. um, Had a lot of fun. Yeah. Like you said, that's why we do it for the stories. That's right. Uh, more importantly, though, I want to thank you for your service. Well, you're quite welcome. I want to welcome you home. Well, thank you very much. Right, sir. Yes, sir. Thank Appreciate you. It.